Hi everybody, welcome to the fourth annual Distributed SQL Summit. Uh, thank you all for joining me. I'm Karthik Ranganathan, one of the co-founders and the CTO of Yugabyte, and uh, very excited to have you guys here. And uh, you know, wh what is so special about the DSS is that it's been more than doubling year over year for the last few years, and uh, you know, there's been a lot of interest, and it's been great having all of you folks, and welcome to the new folks that have joined us this year. This year's keynote is Back to the Future. Let's get started. Okay, so firstly, Back to the Future style. I don't know how many of you have seen the, the classical sci-fi movie called Back to the Future, but if you don't, well, it's probably a good opportunity to do so. But this keynote is going to be themed around it. So fasten your seatbelts because it's going to be a bumpy ride. Okay, so here's the, pre here's the premise. Here's what's going on. A visitor from 2026, about two to three years into the future, comes back and is giving us a heads up about what's coming, right? So based on what we know now and what we're seeing the industry transform into, let's take a look at what the year 2026 will hold for data infrastructure. For those of you who have seen the movie, well, it's Doc, right, the doctor, the good doctor who's really smart, and Marty, the kid that he works with that do everything, and in our version of the story, they both have switched to becoming data engineers because, hey, why not? Data is the next, you know, gold in our economy. Okay, so Doc comes back and tells Marty, who's a data engineer, hey, you'd better get your data infrastructure ready for the crazy times ahead, right? And that's really the, the focus here. So Marty says, okay, Doc, what's up? What's going on? You look a little older, but besides that, what's going on? Well... Doc says, in classical again, back to the future style, roads, you don't need any roads where we're going because we're going to the future. Well, there's three things that you need to keep track of and really keep at the top of your head. The first thing is embrace cloud native to make sure that your architecture, your applications, your database are all truly leveraging the strengths of the cloud while making sure you mitigate the, its weaknesses and down pitfalls. The second thing is to enable, be prepared and enable diverse workloads because workloads are going to be diverse. So can your database and can your infrastructure handle diversity and uncertainty? The third thing is to make sure developer productivity is really, really boosted and up there so you can build and ship features really quickly. Okay, so let's take them one by one. The first thing is about embracing cloud native, the good and the bad. So let's take a look. Well, first off, you know, what is cloud native? On one side, the cloud has a global footprint on commodity servers, which makes it cheap, very attractive, but which also makes it, you know, prone to failures. And you have unlimited compute, at least in principle, fire an API, you get any amount of compute that you need, and you get, you're getting these continuous improvements in, in terms of, you know, Graviton's coming up, ARM processors are coming up, better networking fiber is coming up. So you get these continuous improvements that give you a lot more value and a lot less cost. But you have to be ready to deal with it because failures are the norm. We did talk about commodity infrastructure. You have to really focus on data security and compliance because, you know, the cloud is the public cloud. It's not the data center that people owned anymore. And people should really think about lift and shift does not really work in the cloud. You have to build an architect for the cloud, which makes it challenging. Okay, so Marty says, that's heavy, Doc. Why should we think about going cloud native anyway? Why do I care? Why can't I just keep doing stuff as I've been doing? Well, let's take this in order. The first thing Doc says, 2026, remember, you're going to have users from around the world. It's not just from one country. Can you handle it? Well, Marty, like any person that you talk to right now, says, oh, no problem, Doc, I got it. The customers can just access the application from wherever they are. We'll route the request to wherever our servers are, and bingo, problem solved. Well, Doc says, not so fast. Some things you can work around, and you can bend the laws of physics, but you can never break it. Well, that means you cannot change the speed of light. And that means if you have a user in one country trying to access data and your data is in another country, you will have to wait for the speed of light to go back and to go get, fetch the data and come back to serve the request. And, 
you know, latencies tend to add up. If you look at the East Coast, West Coast of the US, that's a 60 millisecond round trip time. If you look at the US to Australia, if you have a user in Australia trying to access the same thing, well, that's going to be almost 200 milliseconds, right? And these add up. So how you build your application and architecture really matters because users don't care where the servers are. Our, you know, the improvements in infrastructure has led users to become very impatient and very demanding and expect the best of services because if it's not, they're going to switch to some other service. So you have to think about bandwidth, network partitions, how quickly you can access data, and so on and so forth. So what are we really talking about here? Well, let's take a look at a, an application that uses an X-ray mode to actually tell you what's going on. It's really the largest river. For those of you who have followed our previous keynote, this is, I mean, a trivia question. The largest river is really Amazon, and so our the largest river application is a e-commerce application which has, you know, books you can browse and order books and so on. So, without further ado, let's jump right in. The application is called Yuga Bookstore. Let's look at it. Welcome to an advanced view of our application. To the left, you have the mobile app used by the users, and to the right, you've got an internal system that shows you the state of the application cluster and some performance metrics. What do you see on the screen right now? We've got a three-node Yugabyte DB cluster running in Southern California. And this location that is labeled with Los Angeles is the location of this user who lives in LA and interacts with your application. So let's see what happens. So the user is browsing through the product catalog and at some point finally finds the book that he wants to buy. And he adds this book to the shopping cart and buys it. So the latency time for the reads and writes would be around 5 milliseconds on average. Why is that low? Because the user lives in the same region where we have our database deployed. Now, suppose that a few months later, uh, Yuga Store becomes a big success in the United States and you are getting users nationwide. For instance, someone who lives in Washington, D.C. also uses your app and also buys books through this app. Right? Let's find something and uh, probably add this to the product catalog. The latency time for that user would be around 70 milliseconds just because the traffic needs to travel uh, through the country to our database cluster. And which is fine, it's still a very low latency, and for my Yuga bookstore, that's more than enough. I don't want to change anything in my cluster when it comes to the performance. But then it becomes a well-known bookstore internationally. You are getting the first users in Europe. Someone who lives in London also comes to your bookstore uh, tries to find several books, but the latency is higher than for those who live in the East Coast. It's around like 144 milliseconds because the traffic needs to travel under the ocean through the land before it gets to my database. Let's see what happens if you've got a user in uh, India, in Mumbai. For that user, the latency time will be even higher, around like 230 milliseconds, if not more. And eventually, you schedule a meeting and you are thinking what can you do to boost reads at least you need to improve the latency time for the reads because what most of the users do eventually they browse through the product catalog and when it comes to yuga by db you have a wonderful option you can deploy a cluster with read replicas in distant location and this is what you decided to do eventually you deployed a three node cluster in the United States across several regions and then you also deployed multiple read replicas in distant locations in South America, Europe, India and uh, Australia. And so right now when this user from Mumbai interacts through your bookstore, the requests will go through this read replica, the read requests. And you can see that the latency time is as low as for those who live in the United States, just you know around 4-5 milliseconds. But that's the read replica that boosts your reads. What happens when you want to buy a book, right? The latency still will be high, around 250 milliseconds, because all those updates has to be sent to the primary cluster that is in the United States. 
But then eventually you sit and decide that a year later we need to do something with rights. Because right now there are so many users worldwide who buy different books from us and we need to boost, let's say, the performance for rights. We need to do something about that. And how do you boost both reads and writes with YugabyteDB? You certainly can deploy multiple standalone clusters across the globe in each location, or you can deploy a single geopartitioned cluster. With that cluster, you have nodes in every location where you have a significant user base, and in that location, you will be keeping the product catalog and the orders that are relevant for this location. So, right, we deploy this geopartition cluster, and right now, the user who lives in Mumbai, let's check the latency time for him. The latency time for reads, again, will be as low as with read replicas. But now, what if I want to buy this book? I'm buying this book and the latency is no longer 250 milliseconds. It's like 8 milliseconds. This is what I was able to achieve. Now, let's do a quick check and jump to Australia. I have a user who lives in Sydney. And she interacts with the bookstore. All of the requests will go to this node deployed in uh, Canberra. So let's buy a book. And you can see that the same, the latency for reads and the latency for writes is in single digit milliseconds. Wonderful. Wonderful indeed. So that was the fantastic, uh, the largest river app where we saw, you know, exactly how the laws of physics, which is the speed of light, actually determines how a user's experience is going to be. And there's a lot more detail here, but that's just like the tip of the iceberg, right? So, so at this point, Marty says, Ah, makes a lot of sense. Okay, what else do you have for me, Doc? The next thing that Doc says is, protect the database against infrastructure failures, Marty. And, you know, Marty, like any good person in 2022, says, but Doc, cloud failures are rare. I'll just deal with them when they happen because I have a good run book, I have some good basic automation, and I know how to get things done. Well, the first thing to realize is that Failures are not that uncommon, they're not rare. When you go into the world of com commodity, they're actually quite common. Well, if we were in a live audience, I would have asked a poll of how many failures did you think happened over the last year? How many major failures that are like, you know, that impacted a region or a zone or region level failure has happened last year? Well, it turns out there were seven failures. That means there was one major failure every 51 days. And we're talking about zone outage, we're talking about network issues, we're talking about DNS issues, all kinds of stuff, right? That really has a huge impact. And to think that node failures are even more common than all of these failures listed here, these are major failures. And also to think that as the number of applications and the cloud footprint increases, the number of failures that you will start experiencing will go up, right? So that means we cannot treat failures as a rare event. So Marty's question is, okay, that sounds dire. Every 51 days, and that's going to go down, and I'll have to face more and more. It doesn't sound like something I can just wing manually. So how do you architect for a zero downtime? Well, the first thing to do is to always assume that nodes and zones will fail. Well, and therefore, all deployments go to becoming a multi-zone deployment, right? And that's the diagram on the left. So your basic cluster is always multi-zone minimally. You don't go below that um, because, yes, node failures are common, but zone failures and zone outages can happen quite commonly as well, right? And that means a database should continue to work whether a node fails or a zone fails, and that's your most basic deployment. Now, from there, for a regional failure, and remember, we talked about a lot of regional failures and the seven failures that we saw over the past 12 months across different clouds. Well, you have to figure out what is your strategy for you know, dealing with regional failures, and it comes with different trade-offs. The diagram on the left, it shows asynchronous replication, bi-directional async replication. Each region is synchronously replicated across zones, and between regions, you're asynchronously replicating, right? And, and this gives you a a little bit of data loss, but it gives you very, very high uh, throughput, low latency, high performance characteristics across two independent clusters. And the diagram on the right is about synchronous replication where if you're careful, you can still keep your latencies low, but sometimes your latencies could go high, but this is a synchronous stretch deployment across three regions. Depending on how many regions and the application characteristics, you'd pick one of these, right? And the most important thing, well, the user's application, the, to the users, the application still works and they are not impacted. 
So let's take a look at this like in, in practice, in action, right? So in the demo that's coming up, Rahul's going to show you with the visual, uh, visual simulator attached to the cluster, um, you know, a multi-zone deployment where you have like data across three zones and a workload that's actually writing data across these different zones and exercising everything. And he's just going to simulate the failure of an entire zone and show you that the workload is not impacted and it is business as usual. Let's take a look. Let me introduce our in-house workload simulator app. You know, that's how the screen looks like. The bottom left shows how the cluster is laid out in the cloud and uh, the top half shows the latency and throughput numbers against the database. So I have worked uh, my similar app running against my Polite Wombat cluster for all the demos today. Here I show you how to run the simulation read workload on three tables with a TPS of 1024 threads in total. You see a fresh workload starts and its latency plus throughput numbers are starting to warm up. We are almost ready for our first demo here, which is to simulate the loss of one zone and see its zero impact on the running applications against the database. So we know this app screen and I have added a small wall clock at the bottom left to exhibit the fast forward as part of this demo in a cleaner way. So remember, I had started a workload short while ago and the top section shows the application is chugging along nicely. One last confirmation on the cloud console UI before we disrupt our dear Polite Wombat cluster for this demo. Okay, everything looks good. Now we go ahead, we go back to the application and synthetically drop a node from the database. We go to the workload and we go down to stop the node and here you go, you know, one of the database nodes has been stopped in an attempt to create a synthetic node loss. And I leave it here to see that there are some spikes and dips seen, but at no point the graphs fall down dead to the bottom. What I also expect to see here is the cluster topology change reflecting a node loss in a short while, All right? And here you go. We have two nodes left across the two zones. And since this is an RF3 cluster, we still have two nodes sustaining the application load and the application on its part just keeps running with similar latency and throughput numbers. Here you see one of the nodes is marked red and is down, but no red flags visible with metrics, latencies, CPU, or other resources. Okay. Running, running, running. The magic is happening in the background. The node is being added. And here you go. The node has joined back as reflected in the topology. Here, um, the numbers are still looking good on the on the top side or the, or the top half of the uh, screen here. Barring some spikes and dips, the application isn't under stress at all. The things are looking good running the cloud console also reflects the node is brought back everything is hunky-dory looks like we are back in business and we're back in business and i guess doc can go back to the future well not really after that wonderful uh, demo of taking down an actual zone and showing you how uh, you know your applications can continue to run let's look at the next critical piece that doc has to say well he says that your board has your CISO on speed dial because you know, if everything else succeeds, security is still going to be a huge obstacle and is just getting more complex and more important, right? So with uh, compliance, regulations, you know, the number of breaches, with our increasing data footprint, the increasing number of services, yada, yada, blah, blah, right? So what does this really mean? Why is data security and privacy becoming important? Well. It is becoming important because people are starting to trust more and more critical uh, data in, in, to these enterprises, and these enterprises are becoming more digital and leveraging more of the public cloud footprint. They're now operating across more regions. The scale is increasing. The, uh, the level of uh, criticality of the data, how personal the data is, that is increasing. And different countries and governments are getting into what does it mean to protect their citizens and their citizens' data when it comes to digital, right? So, so these are becoming top priorities. And enterprise applications are starting to look at security earlier and earlier in the cycle. Well, not so long ago, it was 
Well, security was the last gate to cross. Well, guess what? Now it is one of the first gates that you have to design for. Uh, things like data lineage, compliance, RBAC, et cetera, everything, you have to think about these concerns upfront, not as something that's a bolt-on later. And uh, if you're trusting a database as a service to simplify your life and you know, have the DBAS take care of all the operations, well, compliance and operational security and to make sure that the data is handled well by the DBAS vendor is also a super important thing. Here are some general principles, right? You have to start with security and data architecture up front, and they go hand in hand because, as the second point says, you need to ensure compliance, and sometimes compliance says there's a certain way you need to handle your data. You might need to keep data resident. You might need to keep data, you know, you might need to forget data. You might have to delete it if your user asks you to delete it, and so on and so forth. And, and in general, a lot of these compliances ask you to make sure you've done your best to ensure that your data is secure and protected against breaches. So that means you have to start with a very secure, in-depth secure posture right from day one, and it has to be a part of your architecture, both from start and as it evolves, right? So, so these are starting to become extremely critical considerations. The second critical area to keep in mind that you know, Doc comes from the future and talks about, is about diversity and uncertainty. Workloads can be diverse. Business needs can be unpredictable. All of this keeps changing. So that's the area we're going to look at in this section. Well, Doc comes and says, well, Marty, there's good news. In two years, about 10% of your applications will be wildly successful. Well, that's great. Well, who doesn't want a wildly successful application? Marty says, yep, it's something we've been talking about as a whole company together, and I know exactly which applications are going to be popular, and popularity usually brings a huge demand on the infrastructure side, so I am planning to pre-provision a lot of machines. I'm just going to get bigger machines and make sure that those applications don't fail as and when they get really popular. So I'm tracking this. I got this under control. Well, the bad news, though, is that you don't really know which applications are going to be successful. They may not always be the ones you thought were going to be successful. Well, at this point, you're probably thinking, well, what is this really? Really, does it really happen that way? Well, it turns out that the scaling needs of applications are extremely unpredictable and no one has a single application. Every enterprise has a portfolio of applications. So let's go through the process ourselves. Well, let's say you have these eight applications that are shown in the slide on the left. And year one, well, they all have some type of usage. Let's call it a normal usage for these applications. Year two, as a company, everybody got together, really discussed which applications are going to be important, and they figured out that applications one and two are expected to see a lot of increase. And the rest of the applications, well, perhaps they stay the same or some even decline. Well, the state of infrastructure as it is today, well, if you think about just what has been done in the past, it's difficult to you know, change your infrastructure to be able to handle such a massive growth, but well, with enough advance notice, you can do something about it. It's definitely difficult to do something if an application declines, but well, as always, let's deal with one problem at a time and deal with the other problems later. Well, that would be the posture that most enterprises would take. Okay. So that was the theory, but what is the practice? Well, in practice, you could actually have your application one take off just a little bit, not as much as you thought. Application two actually took off more than you expected, but the real surprise was application four, which you thought would even decline a little, but it completely took off off the charts, way more than you expected, and so did application seven. So, the outcome is nowhere close to what you had predicted. It's completely different, right? And, and I know what you're thinking at this point. You're probably going to say, really? I don't think that really happens that way. We do a pretty good job of thinking through these things, and you know, the future can't be all that different from how we've been thinking about things. Well, if we look deep down, these are things we've already experienced. Well, let's take a real example, right? Like, let's not, let it not be one person's intellectual thought against another. 2019, the retail industry was looking at these priorities. The first priority was 
in-store facial recognition in order to understand their customer sentiment. So as a user, as a customer, you go to a store, like one of these stores that you want to browse, they want to find out, are you happy with the experience? Because they want to make sure that their brand gets a lot of loyalty, a lot of following, a lot of people coming back to the store, and a lot of people buying stuff. That's the way a retail store really becomes successful. The second thing was around crowd movement analysis, because by knowing the floor plan and by knowing how many people go from one aisle to another or go through you know, one area of the store, they can actually put really interesting products, which are hot sellers, which have huge discounts, et cetera, et cetera, on those locations in the path where a lot of people move, so more people get eyeballs on the items that are really you know, popular or in demand. The third thing is around zero touch shopping in stores because no one likes really standing in a long line figuring out how to check out stuff. So making that experience very smooth and very seamless is actually a great thing for the retail store itself. This was 2019. Well, then we know in 2020 COVID happened and overnight the priorities changed. All of those three applications that were supposed to completely take off and revolutionize and change the way retail would have happened changed overnight, actually, and were not the important items. And it actually changed to these three items, e-commerce and omni-channel, which is about people ordering online, right? Like the behavior completely went online and people said, I want to, I want to pick up store side. I want this item shipped to my home. So a lot more online buying behavior and that brought with it a huge push towards supply chain visibility because you know every time uh, covid broke out for example there was a huge shopping spree where people went and bought up all the like say paper towels and toilet paper and all of these basic amenities and the supply chain would run out and so you'd need a lot more real time and in-depth analysis of what items to order from where where does it ship when will it come so on and so forth right and a lot more partnerships so Overnight, the entire retail industry's important critical applications act changed. Well, this is great for the retail, the retailers, because they were able to make this transition really smoothly. And uh, you know, everyone that was able to make this transition is super happy with the way they weathered the storm. Except the infrastructure group, this will wreak havoc because, you know, the the provisioning of machines, pre-provisioning the size, how much to expect in terms of demand, all of this puts a huge pressure on the team. Because as Marty said, most infrastructure, like most infrastructure teams today think about, let me predict the scale and then figure out what to do about it. And it's more important to handle the scale out scenario where there's a huge surge and we will deal with the scale back down scenario. We'll deal with it when it happens. Well, it turns out both of these become super critical. This is actually quite a complex topic. So let's take another level uh, deep down look at this. How do you even plan for unpredictable scale? Well, the first and most important thing is to focus on seamless scalability, which means that scaling cannot be an operation that happens with a notice. It cannot happen within an hour or two hours period. You cannot be holding the traffic off while scale happens. It just has to happen smoothly. Well, that means one of two things. It means that the architecture is fundamentally ready to scale, which is things like horizontal and vertical scalability with zero downtime, or you have to deal with you know, provisioning an alternate set of infrastructure and copying all the data and then siphoning off your requests from the old infrastructure to the new and doing that over and over and over again. And the problem with the latter strategy is that it's both tiring, so it's gonna be very difficult to find people to do this over and over again, and extremely time consuming and error prone because tired people make more mistakes and you know, bad things happen when you're under pressure, have to do it quickly and have to do the same thing over and over again. So it's extremely important to make sure firstly that the database can scale horizontally and vertically. And, and just a, a note there, vertically is good, Horizontally is even better because horizontally lets you get rid of the, give, give you relief to your database really quickly. You just add a few more nodes and instantly it's able to burst out and handle a larger workload. And when your workload requirements go back down, you remove a few nodes and it's back to being smaller, right? And with vertical, you can actually go ahead and uh, um, change the whole machine one after the other and you should be able to you know, get back into the size that you care about. And the second important piece is that scaling cannot be thought of 
as a one-off operation. Well, you know, back in the day when we were with NoSQL databases, it, they promised scale, but the scale would have to be carefully orchestrated. It wouldn't be something that's just push button. So here, it's important to think about fire an API and start the scale process and keep polling to figure out is the scale done and predictably know when the scale is done and do the same thing in inverse if you want to scale back down. So fire an API to say reduce the size of my cluster and let it do its thing. And if you take this one step further, the DBAS operators can figure out what is better for you based on the database architecture. Should it be horizontal? Should it be vertical? Should it be a combination? Start horizontal and then translate vertical. So there's a lot of details in here, but it's important to realize it's got to be simple and transparent. So the users don't even know it's happening, and one user is not affected just because another 10 users get into the system. All right, so that leads us to the next equally complex and important topic, which is that future workloads will be constantly changing. They're very dynamic in nature. And therefore, database silos won't really work. So at this point, what does anybody say? Well, I do understand that future workloads will be diverse. I will get a set of databases. If I get all the databases and let every workload choose its own databases, I'll have too many databases to run and manage in, 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 you know, operationally, making it almost an impossible task to do so efficiently. So I'm going to take a subset of databases and whitelist them and say that's the list that developers have. In fact, you can go one step further. A lot of people are doing this, which is put a very nice UI for the developers with attributes to say, hey, what type is your workload? Is it, a, is it like document-oriented, relational? Is it got a large amount of data? Does it need low um, latency access? So on and so forth. And they'll ask 20 questions and at the end suggest, look, this seems to be the top database of your choice. Go ahead, build, your, build it, knock yourself out, it's supported. Well, that's great. That gets the developers unblocked and now they can go and build their applications. But does that really solve the crux of the problem, the, the thing that we were talking about in how workloads will evolve in the future? Well, the first thing to realize is that silos are 100% one or the other, but workloads exist in dual states, which means some percentage of workloads have one characteristic, and the other percentage of a workload has a different characteristic. For example, a single workload can have many massive and many small tables. And you may not really know which table is massive and which table is small, and this will change over time. Similarly, you could have workloads that work in public clouds or private clouds and edge. So you could have different things working together to form a workload, and this entire thing represents a single workload. You could have workloads that have relational SQL access and no SQL access where there's scale needed, and that shifts which piece needs scale actually increases over time. Some of the relational access patterns could go on to requiring scale in the future. So let's, take, let's deep dive just into one of these, right? Like let's deep dive into the first one where we talk about large and small tables coexisting and what does that type of a workload evolve to? And, and let's do one better. Instead of keeping this as an abstract conversation, let's ground it in reality, right? So one of the things that you know, we're super proud of at having worked, like we are a transactional database. We're building, Yugabyte DB is a transactional system of record that's scalable, right? And one of the most demanding uh, workloads that we've come across is that of Temenos, which is a core banking application. For those of you that don't know Temenos, Temenos is one of the software, it's a core piece of banking software used by many, many thousands of banks across the world, and they're one of the leaders in the banking industry, and they provide banking software to a number of banks, and that's what lets us do things like, you know, draw money or transfer money and all of this stuff that we do on a daily basis, right? So what does, what does the world look like for Temenos, right? Like, obviously, they're a highly relational transactional system, but Let's look at the scale aspect, right? We talked about large and small tables and unpredictability of workload. Let's go through their journey and, uh, and, and, and try to understand this whole area. Well, Temenos and Yugabyte worked together, and, and, and Temenos actually did a, a press release about this, which has more details, about running a high water benchmark, right? They did this to make sure that they run just ahead of their largest customers, their largest banks, to make sure their software can scale and provide whatever is needed for the most demanding and largest of their customers, right? 
The Terminal software actually serves 1.2 billion users. Uh, what are there, like 8 billion users on the planet? 1.2 billion users are being served by Terminals. Well, if you just think about it, that's a huge, huge percentage of the human population being served for their banking needs by this software. And this is, of course, across thousands and thousands of banks, right? But they ran this workload, this benchmark workload, for a hypothetical bank that has 100 million users. So just that one bank with 100 million users, right? And what they were looking for is a 40% increase in the maximum that they could ever achieve. The banking industry and the financial sector in general is going through a huge uplift, a huge scale, a huge uh, surge, right? It's a good thing. But to be able to handle that comes with the most demanding of needs on the infrastructure team. So they wanted to do 40% better than they had ever done to make sure they're able to keep up with the increasing scale. And that was about 102,000 business transactions, which are like complex transactions doing many, many different operations inside. That, in aggregate, just that 100 million user bank translates to 350,000 write operations, write transactions, and another 80,000 read transactions on Yugabyte DB. So if you think about it, that's half a million database transactions per second in order to support this type of a bank. That's just one bank, right? Now, it so happens that this type of a schema has thousands and thousands of tables, and you have you know, a large majority of these tables being very small, and some tables being very large and needing sharding, right? So, what kinds of complexity and diversity does this type of a, of a bank and banking software and a, a business experience, right? So firstly, there's a number of different banks that you know, Terminos has as their customers, and there's a huge variance across each of these tenants. If you're another enterprise, well, you can just think of a portfolio of applications, and it's the same thing, like a tenant or a portfolio of different applications. And there's a huge variance across these tenants, right, in just the workload characteristics. The second dimension is the variance uh, of performance over time, right? Like, so your actual performance needs are gonna change for any one tenant over time, right? The third dimension is actually across data set sizes, right? Like, uh, how big does your data get? What silos of data are accessed frequently or less frequently, more frequently, so on and so forth, right? And, and remember, the, in the previous example, we said 1.2 billion total users and the largest hypothetical bank of 100 million users, right? So that's barely 8% of the total number of people served, and that's the largest bank with a very long tail. So these variances are real and multidimensional and complex. So let's go through each of these in a little more detail. The first one is about how your performance can vary across apps or across tenants. And you have to customize it and right size it for each app or each tenant, right? To, to make things simpler, let's say in the case of Temenos, there are three different bank types, right? There's a small bank, there's a medium bank, and a large bank based on the number of users that it serves, right? Well, you'll, what you'll notice is that the small banks won't have an exact point that they have to, like, you know, provision hardware and serve. They'll have a band, right? A range that they'll have to take care of. The same thing for medium, the same thing for large, right? And so, there is, firstly, a variance that you have to handle, and the variance is actually different for each of these different categories of banks, how much the spectrum is and how, what percentage it changes. So that brings in the first level of complexity, right? Your different performances of the database for each of these tenants needs to exist in different ranges, and the uncertainty or these band sizes increase and becomes even more unpredictable the more you look in the future. The second thing, is like obviously that your apps, some portions, some queries require very predictably low latencies and cut out like you know your network um, overhead, and other portions require insanely high uh, processing power. Right. So if you look at the second dimension, which is the temporal dimension, over time, what really happens? What you'll notice is that well, some of these banks that are small start becoming medium-sized, medium-sized banks start becoming large. And you know, usually nobody wants this, but sometimes it can go the other way too. Large banks start becoming medium banks in terms of the number of active users and so on and so forth, right? So, so the point is, these workloads are changing constantly. They're changing for any one given bank because it's seasonal, right? Like how many people interact, et cetera, et cetera. And it's across different banks, they keep getting promoted and demoted to different buckets, right? And so right-sizing the application for each one of these scenarios is going to be really difficult. 
The third thing is around data access patterns, which can vary a lot too. So each of these banks could have some percentage of tables, a large percentage usually, that are small, and that need very low latency access by cutting out network, and some percentage, that's a large number of tables sharding and using resources across the cluster. And if you overlay a different bank, like in this example that we're showing in the graph, you'd have a different mix of smaller and larger tables for the exact same application, right? And this changes over time. So no human is going to be good at constantly updating, finding, keeping this uh, changing thing in check. It's better to do that at an architectural level. So this leads us to multi-tenancy and how can you, you know, deal with a lot of banks at scale and how can you diff support different usage sizes for different banks and, and can the database do it automatically? Can the DBAS do it automatically? Okay, so we talked about a lot of complexity in this section, right? So what's the TLDR? Well, in the words of Marty, okay doc, you told me a lot. So what's the takeaway? Well, the key takeaway here is firstly, Make sure that your database silos don't get in the way of you being able to scale in, scale out, and deal with all of this complexity. Point two is make sure that your scalability is seamless to the end user, like the end user doesn't, should not get impacted in any way if you want to scale. And thirdly, make sure that your database is actually powerful enough to support your business um, complexity, variability, all of that into the future and typically relational databases are incredibly powerful and they can do most of the job, right? So don't unnecessarily augment with a new database because that's going to lead to difficulty down the road. Okay, so let's take a look at what else Doc has for us. Well, the third thing was about developers being able to ship and build and ship quicker, right? So the point is, are your developers going to get frustrated at the pace or are they going to be really productive with the way we lay things out? And you might think, what does that have to do with the infrastructure team, right? Let's find out. Well, we are still in the back to the future theme and the fastest speed in back to the future in order to go back to the future is 88 miles per hour. Well, it's probably because the movie came out a bunch of, a while ago, but anyways, your developers want to go like the car that went back to the future, which is really fast, right? Build features and ship them really fast. Okay, so what does this mean? What does this have to do with the, um, with the actual infrastructure group? Let's walk through a real example, right? Like in, enough of hypothetical stuff. Let's go really down and break down and look at an example. The example we're using is, you know, we looked at our two rivers, app, uh, the, two, the, the largest river application. The largest river applications get it, like the one with the, you know, the global latency optimization, all of that stuff. And let's say it is a reactive application. And let's say we are building a downstream microservice. We're building a microservice because a lot of people love it. They start placing orders and we want to fulfill these orders, right? Like we want to pick up the orders and figure out how do we fulfill them? Which warehouse? Who's going to ship them? All of that stuff downstream, right? So how would you do that? Well, firstly, this simple ask of saying, why don't you just process these orders is actually incredibly complex with the current state of infrastructure. This is roughly how it looks. If you want to connect the orders being written into the database to an application that really processes them as these orders are placed really quickly, because, I mean, let's face it, as users, we want our notification really quickly saying, yes, your order was received, yes, your order is being processed, yes, your order is on the way. Right? You want all of that to happen really quickly. You don't want that to take a long time. So. As soon as the, like, it takes you about a day to set up a managed database service, and that's, be, that's really generous, right? It's really, really quick. You just, like, you know, use an API, click a few buttons, you have your database, it's done. Now, the next step is to hook up the database to a change data capture infrastructure, CDC infrastructure, say something like a Kafka or something that can get notified and can message bus that down to the service that we're going to build. And in this example, we haven't built the application because there's nothing to build in the downstream microservice. We first want to have a pipe that delivers the changes and then we can start building it. Well, it turns out it's gonna be about 10 weeks for this business if it's laid out the old way. And from the time you say, okay, let's build an app to downstream process to writing the first line of code in order to actually process. All the developer wants is like, hey, can I start writing that today? And it turns out there's 10 weeks in the middle, right? Why? There are these three big pieces. The middle piece, right, the one that we're talking about, which is the CDC infrastructure, is the one we're going to do a deep dive on because that's the one that seems to take 10 weeks. Why is that the case? Well, it turns out you have to figure out 
how do you set up a cluster with the basic monitoring? And you know, we're, we're not talking about a toy cluster. This has got to be figured out in a way that runs for production because this is something that we'll have to run forever and ever. So you know, typically a week. And each of this is a half a sprint, right, like effectively. So and then you've got to architect your database and you've got to you know, figure out how to uh, hook up the database with this Kafka cluster on the source. And uh, what is the interaction on that side? What is the interaction from the Kafka cluster on the destination, the sync to your application? You've got to figure out those libraries. And then you've got to figure out the end-to-end -end, uh, testing, design, scalability, resilience, setup, infrastructure as code to roll it out, and staging and production, uh, dev, test, uh, your whole CI, CD pipeline, your security, your backups, your hardening. And then you actually have to have alerts, metrics, run books. Well, I can keep going, right? Like, you guys know the drill. So this is a total of at least 10 weeks, right? And they we're being a little conservative here. Typically, people would double this and say, that's probably a closer thing. But, you know, at least 10 weeks. And you need a team to run this. You need a team to operate it 24-7. And that's going to be a two- or three-person team. So in order to start building this application that can fulfill downstream orders, that's the stuff that needs to happen, right? At this point, Marty's like, Okay, I get it. I get what's going on. But what is the alternative? That's how infrastructure teams operate. How does this change? Well, it turns out that you can actually use a push button service for the entire CDC where the, the database as a service, the cloud can fully support reactive applications as a complete unit, right? So you should be able to set up a database with the change push at the tip of an API in one shot, right? There's a couple of ways to go about it. Like, Yugabyte DB natively supports this in the cloud by giving you a push into a webhook that you can start to consume as you write the application. So set up the data database, set up the, um, the CDC push, and just start to consume it right away, and the whole thing takes a day. Or you can integrate Yugabyte DB with like a Confluent cloud where that runs Kafka or some other, like, you know, Kinesis, one of these other things, the PubSub, one of these agents that will do the push and the whole thing has to be integrated well when you're looking for a DBAS so that the whole result to your end developer is it takes just a day and they can start building this stuff, right? So this is an extremely focused way of building where you don't use the time to do other things that, that are not going to move the business forward. Ideally, these are things that you would avoid. Let's take a look at exactly that demo that Brett is going to show. He's going to show us how he set up you know, the, the, the largest river application to become a reactive application to write to a downstream microservice. In this demo, I'm going to show how Yugabyte DB's change data capture feature can be used to automatically stream data to a pre-configured REST endpoint. Now that our Yuga bookstore is a global success, receiving traffic and orders from all over the world, I've decided the need to create a, a downstream microservice to handle all of these orders and to build a UI to aid in the fulfillment of them. In order to do so, I'm using the Yugabyte DB change data capture feature such that when orders are added to my database, they're immediately posted to my web server for further processing. Let's dive into the code a little bit so you can see what I mean. First, I've just initialized a simple Node.js application and I'm serving our React.js app that you can see here. When orders are added to the database, they're immediately posted to this orders endpoint and processed. The process order message function is very simple in that it's simply just sending that order data to the client via server sent event. This might seem like a little bit of a contrived example and it is, but in the real world, you might imagine that this function is actually kicking off the fulfillment process. Now, let's see what I mean. As you can see, we already have one order that needs fulfillment from myself, and the product that I have purchased is called Designing Distributed Systems. But imagine that we have another user interacting with our bookstore, and they wish to purchase the book, The Odyssey of Homer. This user's name is Bob Thomas, and I've connected to my Yugabyte DB instance via the cloud shell. In committing this to the database, what we would expect is that change data capture will immediately post to my orders endpoint in my REST um, 
in my web server, and then this data will be populated in the UI. So as I add to my database, we can see that this has been propagated in the UI immediately without any additional configuration required. Truly, this was extremely easy for me to set up. Now, just so you can see that I'm, uh, this isn't totally fake, I will add an additional record from a user named Mary Livingston purchasing the book Don Quixote. And there we have it, another order in need of fulfillment for our budding new business. And all of this done with very little code, no need for additional configuration or integrations with other services, and no Kafka configuration whatsoever. So more time for coding and less time for debugging. More time for coding definitely makes the business happier. So, and, and Brett happier too, I'm sure, as, as you can see. All right, so let's keep going. So the next thing that Marty says is, but Doc, that's like a one-time thing. Great, you built the app and you put it out. But what if the latency increases or say the notifications take too long or somebody complains? This is an ongoing thing. Is there something there also that we need to think about? And it turns out the answer is absolutely yes. It is the entire life cycle that you have to start thinking about in a cloud native way, right? So as an example, if, if something goes wrong, you'd want the, the, you know, the performance advisor or like a variety of different tools available right at the database side to be able to scan and tell you, look, here are some anti-patterns or here's a query that's running slow or here's a few nodes that are unevenly utilized or uh, any number of things in order for you to pinpoint or at least start your investigation very quickly and you might want to go a step further and say, why don't you give me a snapshot of the database in production, give me that data, and I'll go run it. And you might just want to quickly run it using the cloud shell. You might just want to try a few things until you narrow down the problem and you can put the fix back and send it through the CI CD to make its way into production in really quick time. And if you contrast this with the traditional way of doing things, it would be like, figure out who would give you the logs, who would give you access to the machines, which would be incredibly hard to get. Like each stage would be you know, pretty time consuming in order for you to get to your end-to-end -end solution. So um, in the next demo, Taylor will be showing us exactly how quickly he can analyze live queries, slow queries, and, and, you know, make, and uh, pinpoint the fix. In the past, troubleshooting poor application performance and slow queries has been a bit of a pain to do. Normally it would take multiple teams, tickets, and working sessions to complete. But if you go back manage, slow query viewer, performance advisor, and cloud show, the time it takes to diagnose, solve, and implement fixes is reduced to just minutes. So let's take, for instance, our retail app has started to see some sluggishness after implementing a new query that looks for all the orders that have been paid. The first thing that you want to do is actually go to slow query viewer to get a better idea of what this query is and what it's doing. So to get there, just have to go to the performance tab for the cluster, go to slow queries, and it automatically loads up. So next what we want to do is look for the orders, anything, any select that's been across the orders table. You can see here there's a few of them, but the one we're looking for is actually right here. We can see it's just doing a select star where all this, where the status is equal to a variable, which we know is paid. So now what we want to do to try to get a little bit more detail about maybe do an explain analyze or idea about the query is directly connect to the database. You can do this using our cloud shell. What the cloud shell does is open up a browser window that actually is connected directly to the database. No longer do you have to go to a VM, start up, SSH in, and try to connect to the database. You can connect directly to your database just through the UI here. So what we'll want is to then grab the password for our cluster, put it in here, and we'll automatically connect. Next, we we'll want to connect to our test database so that we can try to take a look at the query itself. So let's go ahead and run that explain analyze on that query to see exactly what's going on. So while it's running, you can see that it is taking a little bit of time. So that actually explains a lot of what we're seeing in the slow query viewer. Um, so we see it's completed and we, you can see exactly what the problem is. It's doing a sequential scan across that orders table. And really what we want it to do is to actually use an index because an index is gonna be a lot more efficient. A sequential scan is gonna cause us to read across multiple nodes and tablets in order to grab this data. So now what we want to do is go ahead and add that index. So we'll just want to create an index on that table, but use it and put the index on the status part. Now, while, that's, while that index is being created, let's go ahead and look at another thing that Ubyte has that really helps performance tuning, which is the performance advisor. So performance advisor, you see here, all you have to do to run that is just hit the scan button. And now what it's going to do is go and scan the cluster and look for things like 
Are there any indexes that are not being used? Or things like where there's a hot shard or hot node, where one or many nodes are being used more than others. And this could cause a little bit of a slowdown across your application because of the fact that really the nodes, only a few nodes are being used. So we can see here, there actually is some things that it's saying here that we have a problem with, which is that we do have some indexes that are not being used. And while these indexes don't look like anything related to our orders, it's something we should take a look at so that then we can, in the future, we can uh, delete these and get a performance tuning back on track. So now that we've looked at this at the performance visor, let's go back to see if our index is created, which looks like it is. So now I'll go ahead and rerun that explain analyze to see if it's helped. And wow, look at that. It's already back and completed. And you can see that we've already gained a 4x improvement on this query. And really, that's just one of the tools that comes automatically with Wyvern Managed. We've been able to significantly improve performance of the application, and even find some other areas where I can start investigating with those indexes are not being used. This allows me to go back to designing and developing my application in no time at all. All right, and that was our last demo. Uh, but don't go anywhere. There's a lot more stuff coming. Uh, remember, now we can send Doc to the future, and we have the future right here with us. Right? So um, I guess what we're trying to say here is a lot of these things that are going to be happening over the three years in the future already have precedent, right? And it's just something that we have to look at to, to see, is this a secular trend that's going to happen more and more, or is this a dwindling trend? And that's you know, something we don't have to worry about too much and, be, and do that with an open mind, right? Um, okay, so for, as promised, a lot of great sessions. Please look at the agenda, but here's a few of them in case you're like really trying to decide which ones to go to. I'll be talking to Nathaniel from Wells Fargo about the future of databases. Uh, it's going to be fun. Nathaniel is extremely thoughtful. Uh, you go by DB Voyager. Um, it's about how we simplify data migrations. Very exciting thing. A lot of interest in the, in the product. Uh, there's a fireside chat where Kanan, my co-founder, is going to be talking with Sriram Samu. And it's about how Kroger is, you know, reinventing themselves digitally and how they're like, you know, building all these apps really quickly and all of that stuff. And uh, a lot of other great content from a number of our partners, you know, Tencent Cloud, AWS, Confluent, um, so on and so forth. So a whole bunch of other people here. So uh, please do stay, have fun, interact, give us a shout out. We'd love to hear from you. And once again, welcome to the fourth annual DSS. Hope to talk to you guys over the next couple of days.